Welcome to Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the power and promise of Generation Z. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I believe that leadership creates a strategic advantage for organizations and is also a key lever for creating the world that we all want to inhabit. I'm a regular contributor to Forbes and the lead author on an award-winning book series focusing on innovating how you lead and transforming your organization. And I'm a fellow with the International Leadership Association. I am delighted that our guest today is Anne-Marie Hayek. She's a cultural consultant and generational expert. So Anne-Marie, would you please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. And it's really fun to be here because I'm representing this generation that I would say is really nothing if not um, innovative, <laughs> right? So when you describe me as a cultural consultant and generational expert, people often ask, what is a cultural consultant? And I will be honest in that I created that designation. And really my background, my professional and my personal backgrounds are very much fused because I've always been really driven by my internal passions. And I look back and from a young age realize I've really always been a student of humanity. And from the time that I was old enough to read, I would pull out my parents' Encyclopedia Britannica. That was back before, right? We had access to everything on the internet. And I would just skip from country to country and read about how different people lived and how they thought and what their cultures are. And then in my 20s, I worked for a lot of the world's largest companies that were expanding all over the world due to globalization and worked with them on helping them understand how people live, how people parent, how people eat, how people do laundry, whatever it might be. And as part of that, continued to really expand my knowledge and passion for culture and for humanity, right? I've just always been passionate about what makes us similar, what makes us different. And then 19 years ago, started my company, Global Mosaic, which I decided to call a cultural consultancy because when you're an entrepreneur, you get to, you get to create what you want to create. And so that's really what I wanted to continue to do is to have input into the projects that we took on and work with companies and work with organizations and even work with presidential candidates and helping them understand culture and our cultural transitions and transformations and trends. And so that's that's the definition of cultural consultancy for me. And then as part of that, certainly doing a lot of work in the generational space, right? Because that's so much about how we evolve as a culture. And generations are so imperfect, I would never... Uh, I would be the first one to say it is as much an art as a science. We're all individuals, right? We don't want to oversimplify or overly gloss over things. But certainly the point in time in which we grow up and what is happening in our world or our country, economically, politically, socially during those formative years, it impacts a, a cohort of people and their worldview and their values and how they look at things. And so that's so generations and the study of generations has always been a big part of what I've done as well. And so you're also going to be talking about your book? I am. So my book, Generation We, The Power and Promise of Gen Z, launched on Amazon and other booksellers uh, about a month ago. And after four days, we became a bestseller on Amazon in multiple categories, which was thrilling. And I think that Generation Z is a... They are a generation that we are starting to, or have been the last couple of years, hear a lot about and recognize the power of them. And whether someone is a business leader or an educational leader or a government leader or even a parent, they're wanting to better understand who is this generation, right? Who is this generation that suddenly we're hearing so much about and that seems to have so much inherent voice and power in the world? Who are they? What made them who they are? Um, what's coming? Right? They're still very young. Gosh, when we look at them, it feels like they're going to have some kind of impact. What is that going to be? And so that's what my book is all about. It's really divided into two parts. The first part is called The Roots of Their Power, which is really, again, what makes them who they are. The time that they grew up. It speaks to their diversity. It talks to their, to their innovative um, way that they view gender. Uh, it talks about their digital nativism. It talks about their inherent activism. It talks about those things. And the second half of the book is called The Coming Transformation. And it really talks about 
what that is going to mean in terms of how we operate as a society and as a culture. What does that mean for how we evolve capitalism? What does that mean for the future of our politics? What does that mean for the future of climate? What does that mean for the future of identity? What does it mean for the future of work and education and all of these things? So I spent about a year and a half researching, interviewing, doing both quantitative and qualitative research with thousands of Zs across the US. So I very much see myself as a messenger, really giving a platform to this generation because I'm Gen X, right? So I don't, I don't pretend to have, uh, you know, I didn't grow up at the time that Gen Z did, right? So I really give a huge shout out to these thousands of Zs who really worked very closely with me over the course of a year and a half so that I can really represent the way that they view the world, the way that they view the future. And this book is the platform to express that to the world. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So for our listeners, as, as you heard Anne-Marie talk, we're going to be talking about her book, Generation We, how they evolved and what they envision and why we should be hopeful with them as the emerging generation, that they're not naive idealists, they're hardened realists with a bold vision on how we can transition, recreate, and progress forward, building on where we are now. So Generation We is your invitation to see the future that they will create as it's unfolding. And I would say also to think about how we partner with each successive generation so that we can create a future that they're going to inherit. And for me as a leadership professional, I really want to understand how each of the generations work together in a workplace and for Many of us, Gen Zs, are going to have a significant role in the world while we're still working, and they may be running the world as we're retiring. So why should your readers care about why Gen Zs differ from their predecessors? Yeah, and I love, by the way, Maureen, what you just said, is that while this book is all about a generation, Generation We, the larger intent of it certainly is to inspire and foment more cross-generational understanding and more cross-generational conversation because the power comes when we work together, right? And actually, one thing that's really interesting in working with Gen Z is that when you ask them what they think the largest divide in our country is right now, they will say generational. And it's so interesting because when you talk to us, right, whether we're millennials or or exes or boomers we tend to feel that the largest division in our country is political it's right left democrat republican but z's are actually much more unified in much of their worldview and they have a very cohesive culture within themselves which isn't to say that they're not made up of individuals and that there are some that are republican and some that are Democrat and most of them who identify as independent in the middle because they don't like to put be put into a box, but it means that they really do um, view themselves as being fairly cohesive and they feel that the rest of us don't really understand them. And so that really is a, a huge objective for me in writing this book is to really foment these cross-cultural, this understanding and this communication, which needs to happen, as you're saying, in the workplace. Um, and in really every other arena of, of our society. And, it, and it's not happening as it should be. And, and actually, part of the reason that I really did write this book also is because, as I said, we've been studying generations for years, right? We've been studying, for example, boomers and how they're approaching aging differently or health and wellness differently or, or millennials and how millennials and startup culture have really recreated how we think about work. And that was even pre, pre-COVID, right? Um, the impact on on work and how we show up for work and what workplaces look like and what millennials demanded and asked for from workplaces, et cetera. And then when I started looking at Gen Z a couple of years ago and we started having clients who were asking us to partner with them and helping them do research and understand Gen Z, what really became clear to me, and this this might speak to you and, and your readers as well, but most of what's been written about Gen Z was really superficial. And I think that we as a society tend to trivialize youth. Right? We like to think of ourselves as we have this lived experience, we've been working maybe for decades, we've been living for certainly decades, and so of course we must know more about our systems 
than a 16 year old or a 17 year old or 18 year old and yes certainly we do have a lot more lived experience but there are things that I'll talk about that explain how their connectivity digital connectivity from a young age and the way that they interact and share stories and discuss and debate things on their online platforms actually gives them huge access to a diverse range of lived experiences and perspectives that make them really wise beyond their years, beyond what we would expect. And so the superficial narrative that I found of two years ago was a lot being written about how they're digital natives, but not really about the power that that gives them. More, if you do a Google image search actually for Gen Z, you will get pages and pages and pages of young people staring at their screens, right? So that's really trivializing that, when in reality, yes, they are sharing dance videos and memes and things like that. But a lot of their time is spent sharing their personal stories. And a lot of their time is understanding what's happening in the world and discussing and debating that. And we also hear about their cancel culture, which I'd love to talk about more today, right? Which is really an attempt on their part to call out where they see people, organizations perpetrating some of the weaknesses, I would say, in our in our systems, right? And it's their way of, of calling out and trying to help us to have awareness of what's happening and move us all forward and create progress. It's not always perfect, but it's intended to be accountability. It's not that they're just angry and trying to cancel everything. And they're also very solutions oriented. So about a month into COVID, I conducted this mobile research amongst 1500 Z's across the US. So that would have been around April or May of 2020. And I asked them some questions around how COVID was impacting them and also what their vision was for what we were learning as a culture and as a society and how we might emerge out of COVID. And what I found is that their resilience, their strength, their ideas, their wisdom were just absolutely astounding. So that was really my initial inspiration to write this entire book is this is a generation that we really need to listen to. Um, so why should we care about Gen Z and how they differ from their predecessors? They're very different from millennials. And when we work with companies, what we hear so much is that companies and organizations often think that Zs are just a younger version of millennials. You know, and I think we've all spent so much time focused on millennials for the last 15 or so years. And what's interesting is millennials certainly had an impact on our society and continue to have an impact on our on our society. But I think that their name suggested, right, they started as Gen Y, and then we named them the millennials somewhere along the way because they were coming of age during the change of the millennium, right? And so you remember how we were also we were also tuned in to that 2000, what was gonna happen? Were all of our computers going to crash? Were we suddenly going to have this great leap forward in our shared humanity and how we viewed each other and how we operated? It turns out not so much. I mean, humanity continues to march forward and millennials have had some incremental impact, but they haven't been super, super pivotal. And what I was really seeing and what I write in the book is that it turns out 2020 was super pivotal. Right? And I think we're all standing here now and we're looking back and we know that and we see that. And what we know is that we're not, we're not going to go back to how things were before. The question is, in what ways do we evolve? And then you have this, at this exact moment, you have this generation that is coming of age. And they're coming onto the scene. And they are the largest generation. They are now larger than millennials. We are obsessed with millennials for many, many years, but they're actually, Gen Z is now larger than millennials. But what makes them really extraordinary is how they're so united. And if I may, I'd love to talk about what makes them so united because I think this is really one of the superpowers that they have. So before you do that, I don't know that our listeners know exactly what ages Gen Z's are now as of this recording. So when do when does millennial stop and Gen Z start? Excellent question. So again, it's not a perfect science, but social scientists attempt to look at changes in our political, economic, social, cultural trajectories. And the decision was made that around 1997, was when the millennial generation ended and the Gen Z generation began and goes through and Gen Z goes through about 2010. So what that means is that they are 
uh, you know, roughly from around uh, maybe 10 years old or so right now, 11 years old right now to 23, maybe turning 24 this year. And already social scientists have decided that really anybody that's 10 or younger right now is probably going to be part of the next generation, which we're already calling alpha, because their life will always be marked by COVID. Education for them will probably always have some level of remote learning. The workplace will always look quite changed on the other side of COVID. And so Gen Z is really marked by their digital nativism. They were very, very young or maybe not even born yet when the iPhone came out in uh, 2007, right? And so that's one of the things that really mark Gen Z. And I, again, can talk about the impact of that. The story is not that they're digital natives. The, the story is behind who that has created as a generation and the power that that gives them and how that makes them different than previous generations. So what is the power that gives them? So it's, again, doing a quick comparison about millennials and Gen Z, because I think that this surprises a lot of people. We think about millennials as being pretty digitally savvy, but the median age of a millennial when the iPhone came out was 19. So think about that, right? They didn't, they didn't grow up for the most part with a device in their hand. And, and we talk about the millennials as the Instagram generation as well, but, but the median age of a millennial was 22 when Instagram came out. So Instagram has really been, it is the millennial app, but it's really the millennial app that they've used in their 20s and beyond. Whereas for Gen Z, before they were in kindergarten, <laughs> there were iPhones and really all of the apps that we use now, right? Whether it be Facebook or whether it be YouTube or whether it be Instagram or whether it be Snapchat, the only one that came along a little bit later was, was TikTok a couple, a couple of years later. So what that means is a couple of things. It means that they've always been connected to each other digitally. And actually TikTok, right, TikTok is the one that in the last five years or so has really become the dominant Gen Z app. If you ask Gen Zs which is the app for our generation, they will say TikTok. 90 plus percent of them will say TikTok. And here's what's super interesting about that algorithm is that we think about Facebook or Instagram, right? And we go down and we scroll through our feed and it's our friends or the people that we've connected with. It's maybe some sponsored content. But on TikTok, they open onto something called a For You page. And it's certainly the people that they follow, but it's also content that has been crowdsourced and has received the most likes in the last, you know, 24, 48 hours, whatever it might be. So, and these are all videos, right? These are all like 15 minute videos. And so what it means is that Zs are out there sharing their personal stories. So any Z anywhere in the country or really in the world can open up their TikTok on any given morning and they're seeing a lot of the same stuff. It might be the story of a black youth in Chicago and his or her encounter with the police. It may be, it may be a trans youth in, Alabama, right? Who's talking about what that is like to come out. So that means back to the days when we were young and there were a few TV stations and we all got a consistent message. Now through crowdsourcing, we may actually be going back to a large volume of young folks hearing a similar message. I, yes, Maureen. And I love it. And I feel like the this might sound a little silly, but I th feel like for us to have achieved the same kind of understanding and, and exposure to all these diverse lived experiences would have been like when we were teenagers, if we came down to our breakfast table every day and there were, say, 10 strangers sitting around our breakfast table. And let's say I'm 17 and there are 10 17-year-olds sitting around my breakfast table, but they're from all over the country and all over the world. And they each tell me while I eat my breakfast their individual story and what it's like to be 17 and to be assuming whatever identity they're assuming, what they're struggling with, etc. And then the next day we come down to breakfast and it's another 10. That's essentially how these Zs are growing up. And so to them, their exposure and their worldview and their ideas are not limited to their geography. It's not limited to the conversations they have around their dinner table or their neighbors or just the people in their neighborhood or even at the school, right? Which is absolutely incredible. And so one of the things that I found most powerful from all the research we did over that year and a half is we would do research, right, where we would ask about Z's opinions on critical issues, whether it be climate or whether it be gun regulation or whatever, whatever it was. 
and we would intentionally cast the net wide enough amongst thousands of Zs so we could slice and dice the data different ways. And then we would intentionally look at red state versus blue state, urban versus rural. We'd break it out all different kinds of ways and found that there was no statistically significant difference in how Zs from a red or a blue state or an urban or rural area view a lot of these issues. And it's because they're exposed to such a broad range of perspectives and they have this culture of, dis of discourse where they love sharing these stories. So is that why politics and the divide of left-right that we're seeing for many of us at, at, who are politically active right now, the right-left seems to be often a rural-urban divide is their exposure to people more universally closing that divide? It's closing that divide. And you know what's really interesting is that when you look at Zs, first of all, a third of Zs identify as independent. They refuse to check the box of Democrat or Republican because of their exposure to the complexity of issues. And they don't want to have to ascribe to the left or the right or have someone else define what their position has to be on something. They're very independent thinkers. They also view our two-party system as really limiting and destructive to our democracy, frankly, right? If you think about Z's, they have really only, they really only remember the last two elections. So maybe they remember 2016 between Hillary and Trump, and maybe they remember the debate where Trump was right behind Hillary. Do you recall that on stage behind her? It ended up becoming an, an, SLL, an SNL episode set to the uh, feature music from Jaws, the da 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 right? Or, or they remember the debates from the most recent Biden-Trump campaign, or they remember all the fallout and the capital rights. And so to them, you know, we are old enough that we remember debates that were really debates. We've seen examples of bipartisan cooperation. For these young people, they haven't necessarily. The, and, and Zs tend to be progressive leaning, and that is the generation along with the youngest millennials that really drove the Biden margins, Biden margins to the largest extent in this latest election. In fact, if you really drill down on the numbers, if only 45 and older had voted, Trump would have been reelected. It was really the 18 to 29 year old cohort that voted overwhelmingly in Biden's favor. But again, even within Zs, we're made up of individuals, right? And about 20% of Zs identify as Republican. But what's really, really fascinating, Maureen, is that because of their exposure to the digital world, even amongst the 20% of Zs that identify as Republican, the majority of them agree with the statement that Blacks are not treated equally to whites. The majority of them agree that global warming was created by human behavior. The majority of them will say that the government needs to do more to help solve our problems. So, so many of these underlying kind of Republican beliefs that are true for older generations of Republicans are not true for Gen Z Republicans. So even within Republicans and independents and Z liberals, there's so much more of a shared platform in terms of where we're at and where we need to go. So what impact do you think that's going to make, especially because you said they're the largest generation? So can you give us some numbers on what proportion and how do you see that playing out over time? Because you said they vote. They do. And they're still really young. So the median age of a Z right now is 17. So they're still, again, they're between the ages of 10, just turning 11, and 23, turning 24. And so they are now 27% of the U.S. population, again, the largest population, so that's significant. But the majority of them still couldn't vote yet, right, in this last election in 2020. What's really interesting, though, is that they showed up. They really, really, really showed up to vote. So the youth vote is is often criticized, right? And if you look at the science, the youth vote is usually the smallest, there is the lowest turnout for, for youth voting, right? And it's been as low as 25%. But for this last presidential election, it was 46%, which is actually the highest percentage of youth turnout that has been recorded. So 
this generation is definitely largely driving that. And even so, Gen Z only made up 10% of our voting electorate. But again, they're 27% of the U.S. population. So within the next seven to eight years, they will all be able to vote. So they will certainly make up much more than 10% of our voting electorate. It's also really interesting because the boomers were such a huge generation, right? And the boomers for the last about 40 years have really driven so many of our political priorities and certainly made up the largest voting bloc. And for the first time in 2020, the youth voting bloc, um, which I would say is Gen Z plus millennials, was about 40% of our electorate. And boomers were about 40% of our electorate. And then you had in the middle Gen X, which is me, and we're the forgotten generation that no one ever talks about. <laughs> it's okay. I don't have any issues around that. None at all. Um, but anyway, so so it's really super significant, right? This is really the first election, and it's been happening increasingly, but that youth were really able to flex their muscles. But in terms of in terms of their impact overall, I think one thing that's really interesting, and I think this is why this book is so important at this time, because even three years ago, we didn't really pay any attention to Gen Z. And then what happened is in 2018, I would say, is when they really came on the scene. And that was the school shooting in Parkland, Florida. And that was when Emma Gonzalez and those Parkland kids stood up and literally said, we call BS. We call BS on your thoughts and prayers. We call BS on your lack of ability to keep us safe in schools. And then a month later, organized March for Our Lives in DC, in which a million people showed up and wow, this that was all run by kids. The eldest speaker was a high schooler that day. And then within a couple of months, we had Greta Thunberg, right? And she started marching. She started walking out and striking in terms of in front of parliament. And then she inspired a whole generation around the world. And in 2019, the youth of the world organized the climate strike, 4 million people across 163 countries, I believe. That was youth led. And then shortly after that, we had Black Lives Matter. And, and so, of course, that was cross-generational, as it should be. But our youth was really engaged in that. By the end of summer 2020, 77% of Gen Z said that they had participated in some kind of Black Lives Matter rally. So we continue to see them. In fact, right now in Texas, right, one of the latest big pieces of news in our country is the Texas is the new law around Texas abortion, the six week thing, et cetera. As part of that, Texas set up a tip line where people are to report anyone who's seeking an abortion or performing abortions. Well, guess what Gen Z has done? <laughs> they have filled the tip line with the pictures of GOP polit politicians, with, me with Shrek memes, with all kinds of things, they are attempting to crash the site. I mean, they're essentially making it unusable, right? Because, <laughs> because of their takeover of this tip line. And so they're really, really powerful and they're really showing up in all of these ways. And it's making people really start to pay attention and say, hey, who are these guys, right? And they're just getting started because again, their median age is 17, right? Imagine when they really can vote. Imagine when they really are in our workplaces. Imagine how much they'll transform things then. So what do you anticipate? I think of words like gender non-binary and uh, some of the other concepts that I, I'm hearing about, but I haven't seen it yet entering the workplace. Because as you said, they're just, they're high school to work or they are mostly still in college. Although we do have two interns on our team who would be right on the cusp. So it'll be interesting to see the impact they make because they'll be helping edit this show. What do you expect them to do in organizations? It, it sounds like it's going to be dramatic. It is. And both in organizations and, as I said, in politics, in corporations, in our educational institutions, it's interesting that you bring up the non-binary, right? Because I think that's one of the things that us older generations look to Z's with some lack of clarity on why all the pronouns, <laughs> why all the, and what I would say is, I mean, pronouns are a very small part of this larger Gen Z value, 
which is that they are essentially creating an identity revolution. And I think that's going to have an impact on all of us. And so by an identity revolution, I mean that they believe that your identity is something that all of us should have the right to create ourselves. And none of us should be limited by any of the conditions of our birth. So yes, it sounds somewhat utopian for sure, but this is something that they are very much committed to and, and within their generation, making a lot of progress in. So my opportunities in the world, my identity in the world should not be limited by the zip code that I was born in. It shouldn't be limited by the color of my skin. It shouldn't be limited by the biological parts that I was given, right? And so when they think about, for example, gender, they they divide things up into three parts. You have your you have your biological parts. Are you born with girl parts or boy parts, right? And that is just biology. That's what it is, right? And if you decide at some point due to, via surgery, you can actually change that at some point. But you are born with biology. But they completely separate that from gender identity. So just because I was born with girl parts, I might decide that I identify more as male. So I can do that. I don't have to be limited, again, to that condition of birth. And then, of course, the whole third definition is then who do I love? Who am I attracted to sexually? So they think about all those things very differently. And so the reason pronouns are so important to them is because, and again, inherently, if you believe that I should be able, I have the right to create my own identity, then any time you use a pronoun, you are inviting somebody and anybody who's in the room you were saying, I, I recognize your right and your freedom to create your own identity. How would you like to identify? How would you like me to refer to you? And so that's why that's so important to them, right? I, I talk also a lot about, I think it's in my chapter, The Superpower of Diversity. I talk about the new math of inclusion. And there are two numbers that I think are so powerful. And it's one half and one third. And the one third refers to the percentage of Gen Z or the fraction of Gen Z who identify as non-binary. One third, one third, right? Don't want to strictly identify as the binary of man or woman. Now only about 16% of them actually identify actively as LGBTQ+, but it may mean that they're exploring. It may mean that they don't want to conform to gender conventions. The other number one half refers to race and ethnicity. So for the first time, and this is super significant, this generation is only about half white and then half non-white. And when we think about the boomers, for example, who've dominated everything from our culture to our politics for so long, boomers are 82% white. They can't help that. that. Those are just the demographics of that generation. But so when you think about the impact of of a generation that was 82% white versus a generation that for the first time now is 50-50, right? That means that all of these issues that it have traditionally impacted minorities now suddenly come to the fore and get a lot more attention. And what you really see is that this generation operates across the entire generation to advocate for each other and be allies to each other. So for example, getting back to Black Lives Matter, Actually, 14% of Gen Z are black. But as I said, 77% participated in Black Lives Matter by the end of summer 2020. And 90 plus percent of Gen Z are pro Black Lives Matter and pro all of the things that that represents. You look at the LGBTQ community, 16% of, L uh, 16 of Gen Z identifies LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus, but 90 plus percent support equal rights for people anywhere along the gender spectrum. Right. So that has huge impact for how we think about how they show up, what they demand, um, how, how we run our workplaces in the future sound like the, the issues of inclusion will dissipate, not magically, but as they step in and take bigger roles, things that we've been fighting to change it sounds like they'll almost just be a non-issue because our new generation doesn't see through those lenses. It's definitely something that is going to continue to progress. But right, I agree with you though, that it's something that is not, it's not going to happen without work and it's not going to happen without intention. We actually just wrote an article last week for Fast Company. Fast Company asked us to write an article about the future of work and Gen Z versus millennials. And we talked about a number of things, but 
Certainly one of those things is that due to their diversity, Gen Z is very, very aware of the lack of representation. And they do not want to work for companies that aren't very intentionally working on their diversity and inclusion initiatives and that don't have meaningful representations. These talk a lot about true representation versus tokenism, right? Tokenism being, sure, you show in your communications that you have this diversity of employees or consumers or whatever it is, but I wanna see who is on your board. I wanna see who's your on, who is on your executive floor. This again goes back to how this young generation is so aware and educated at such a young age. There was a TikTok video, again, a little 15 second, TikTok is primarily these 15 second short videos that went viral amongst disease about a year ago. And it was a young TikToker who looked at the CEOs from the top, the Fortune 100, and exposed that out of those, there were maybe three women of color, I think there were three women maybe total, and there were just a handful of men of color and there were 90 plus white male CEOs. There were more white male CEOs named Michael, David, there was one other name that I'm not recalling now, than there were you know, more, more CEOs, white male CEOs named Michael, than there were in their entirety CEOs that were of color or female, right? So, and these are the kind of things that go viral. So when we, when we trivialize youth and we say, oh, they're just looking at dance videos, they're not. These are the kinds of things that go viral and these are the kinds of things that they're really paying attention to. And it's really changing their requirements for the companies that they buy from and the companies that they seek employment from. So I just actually, as you're saying that, I was looking at our website to see how we were represented and we're certainly not 50-50, but our representation isn't just pictures on the website of diverse people. We actually have a fellow who is black and a co-author who is black and LGBTQ people. You can't tell that by looking at the website necessarily because we don't label them, but we have made an effort and it to your point, it takes deliberate work that that we are including. But for me, it takes deliberate work. It sounds like for them, it won't even be that much of a thought again because their friends are diverse. Absolutely. And and again, it's going to be progress because, as I said, if if boomers were 82 percent white, then, of course, workplaces have historically been largely white. I mean, that was our pool of employees, right? But now, as these more diverse generations, millennials were more diverse as well, but not to the extent that Gen Z are, we will have to intentionally work toward creating that kind of representation moving forward. And Zs are absolutely demanding it. And companies who refuse, I mean, I have a, a little case study. I've got several case studies in the book, but I think this is, this is something that makes it feel very tangible. And this is not just about diversity and inclusion, but this is also about sustainability practices, which they demand. Um, and also when they talk about diversity, it goes beyond race and gender. It's related to um, everything from range of ability to certainly in the way that companies, fashion companies, are representing people in their communications, a range of body diversity. So, for example, Victoria's Secret, right, which we know for older generations was a very successful company for decades, for decades. And then about two years ago, they were under attack largely by Gen Zs and some younger millennials as well because their famous runway shows represented almost no diversity. Um, no diversity in terms of body <laughs> shape or size, certainly. No diversity along with the gender spectrum. And Zs and the other young people called them out on it and said, we demand that you be more inclusive. That's who we are. If you're going to speak to us and be a company for us, you need to represent greater inclusion. And Lex Wexner, who was the CEO at the time, actually went as far as to say, I would rather cancel our runway shows than disappoint the men who watch them and ruin the Victoria's Secret fantasy. He said that. And in response, the stock fell 
he had to resign. In the wake of that, driven by Gen Z and other young generations, there's a company called Airy. They have been hugely successful. They made the commitment several years ago that they were not going to retouch any of their photography. They represent a range of body diversity and gender identity, lots of user-generated content of people themselves who are posting images of themselves feeling great in their you know, undergarments and feeling proud and, and beautiful and everything else in, 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 in their bodies. And there is a new company that's only a couple years old Cami Tellez, I believe at 21, founded Parade, which maybe you've read about, and she, which is an underwear company, and she founded it because she felt that there was not any company that fully represented Gen Z values in the underwear space. So her company is sustainable, it's inclusive, and it's actually really interesting. In the article that we read for Fast Company, we actually included parades we included from her company an example of how they advertise their job openings and how they intentionally call for people of diverse backgrounds and diverse perspectives and so it's really interesting you know if you as a company or as an organization don't take an active role in changing your requirements when it comes to diversity inclusion and sustainability and these various things Guess what? Not only will your business suffer, but increasingly as these Z's come of age, they just create their own companies that just steal your lunch. <laughs> so I think that's a great that's a great case study in one specific industry where that's actively happening and has been happening the last couple of years. So what I hear is a few things like as a company, I need to know what I stand for. What are what are my values? What's my vision? And I need to be addressing social, what I'll call maybe ESG, so environmental, social, and governance related issues aggressively. And and the word tokenism comes to mind that, that I have to be making real substantive moves, not just changing the pictures on my brochure or you know, changing the words in, in my ads, but I substantively have to be hiring and creating an environment because my guess is if they join my company and they find out that I'm practicing tokenism, the backlash will be worse than doing nothing. Absolutely. And because these are so digitally savvy, they know, right? They, they have access. They can go on and they can look at your board. They can go on and they can look at your executive suite. And so they go way beyond the communications that they see, the external facing communications that they see. Another thing that I would say that's a real difference between millennials and Gen Z and that we wrote about in this Fast Company article was that, you know, millennials were more of a, and, and nothing against millennials, we're all just a product to some degree of, of the time that we were raised, right? They're a little bit more of a bubble generation. I mean, that has been written about them, and meaning that, you know, they were... They didn't have access. Again, they didn't have access to everything that was happening in our world digitally. And so they tended to be a generation, when I say bubble, that were protected more. They were they had they had an existence where they didn't worry so much about what was happening in the broader world. They focused on, you know, their sports and their school and their fun and their music videos and whatever it was, right? And and parents tended to kind of helicopter at that at that point in our culture and schools as well, right? And it's even been said that they 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 were coddled. I don't know that I'd go as far as to say that they were coddled, but they certainly were a little more of a of a bubble generation. And so they didn't have as much of an understanding of, of what was really happening in the real world because really how could they have because of the way that they were raised in their lack of digital access until they really were older, like maybe college and in their 20s. And so when they entered, entered college and when they entered the workplace, there was adulting became like the word of the year right around that time. And it was this idea of gosh, this is what it looks like to be an adult and to be adulting and getting my first apartment and working for a company. And companies companies really attracted millennials by promoting the fact that they had baristas that would make them coffee and they had these creative workspaces that were fun, startup spaces. And hey, we have a cool rooftop garden where you can have your lunch. I'll tell you what, Z's are, and in the intro that you offered, Maureen, which I loved, you said they are not idealists, they are hard realists. And they are because these young Z's from a young age have had access to 
everything that's happening in our world on their devices, right? When 9-11 happened, which of course we just recognized, when 9-11 happened and millennials were elementary or middle school age, they didn't have devices. So most of them didn't see it happen live. And then parents and school administrators had discussions about how do we share this with our youth? How do we explain it to them? You know, how do we create safe spaces to share this with them? Whereas Z's have watched, you know, they watched George, George Floyd, you know, on the ground. They see the mass shootings unfold. They saw the footage a few weeks ago of Afghans hanging on to those, those airplanes. They've seen all that from a young age. So they are really more interested in what's raw and real in the world. They're not as easily distracted by these perks that aren't particularly meaningful to them. So that's actually really important too because a lot of employers are still attempting to attract Gen Z talent with, hey girl boss, you like coffee? You like having your lunch on a, you know, on a rooftop garden and Z's look at this and they say, oh my God, we are so much more um, substantive than this, right? We see the world for what it is. I don't care about all that. I mean, sure, barista, someone make me coffee, that's always going to be good. But I want to come into your workplace and I want to know what you really stand for and I want to be part of a mission that I can really get behind. That's what's important to me. That's what they want to hear from companies. You talked earlier about cancel culture and tied it more to activism than just canceling. It, because that label is has become so pervasive and divisive, can you talk a little bit more about how they do it, why they do it, and why we care? Absolutely. So what I would say in general, which is, it's kind of like when you ask about pronouns and I say, let's take about 10 steps back and let's understand that it's really about a larger identity revolution. And that's why pronouns are an important part of that. Same thing, cancel culture is really a smaller part of Gen Z culture, which is around having substantive, constructive conversation. And they're not afraid of having substantive, constructive conversation. And to critically examine each other and critically examine our culture and critically examine our systems. And a lot of this goes back to how we were talking about the social media platforms that they grew up on. So again, we tend to go to Instagram or we tend to go to Facebook and we tend to be in our echo chamber. And so the people that we follow or whatever, and of course this has been written about a lot, tends to reinforce already our community, our worldview, our thoughts, whatever it might be. Because of the way that Gen Z is, number one, so diverse in so many ways, right? I mean, there isn't there isn't really an us versus a them. There's just a lot of diversity. And then because of the fact that they grew up on apps like TikTok, where they're sharing all those diverse experiences, they don't have an echo chamber in the same way that we do. And so they're accustomed to really discussing and debating and critically examining all of these di- all of these different aspects of our society. And they're just not afraid of that. And so they do that in the same way then online when they see something that they think needs to be critically examined, they call it out and they call it out publicly. And if you talk to Z's, they'll say, we didn't call it cancel culture. We're not really trying to cancel anybody. If we call you out for doing something, that is an invitation. It's meant to be an invitation to engage you and our broader society in a critical examination of what's going on here. That's a huge distinction that they want conversation and nuanced conversation versus go away. Huge distinction. Absolutely. And if you don't mind, if I can say two other things really, really quickly, is I think older generations think it's Gen Z that are trying to call out the rest of us, but it's not. That is within their own culture. So actually, their social media pages have been blowing up the last week because they've been critically examining what AOC wore to the Met Gala and just critically examining it. And they love, we know Z's in many ways really love AOC, but the dress that she wore, tax the rich, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of discussion about how they feel about that, how they feel about that platform, et cetera, et cetera. The last thing I wanna say about this is that very much during millennials, we heard a lot about safe spaces, about our schools and universities creating safe spaces, right? Where they didn't feel threatened or, or, or overly challenged or whatever it might be. Z's have turned that on its head and said, we wanna create brave spaces. 
we want to create brave spaces where we can have the hard conversations. And they feel that they're trying to engage older generations and that older generations aren't willing to go into the brave spaces because we're so much more used to living in our segmented world where, oh, you listen to CNN, you listen to Fox News, that means we can't talk to each other. Z say, no, 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 we all need to come together in these brave spaces and have these, these conversations across generations and across the political divide. And that's really what all of this critically examining our systems and our society so that we can move forward. I think we'd all agree at this point, coming out particularly the last several years of the most divisive political culture of you know our lifetimes, we all need to have more conversations. And Z's are saying, meet us there engage with us. When we call something out, meet us there and engage in those conversations with us. We're not trying to cancel you. Again, it just seems like such an important distinction that we are interpreting them incorrectly. That in many instances, like the pronouns and underlying identity and choice, that I have autonomy in who I am, what happens with my body. I want to be able to have a voice in the political system and how the climate's going to impact me. How do we show up as allies and help them navigate the burden that they're carrying to address a lot of damage that they're going to be shouldering from economic deficits to climate deficits to supporting folks because Social Security may run out? and the population is aging, they have a lot to support going forward. They do. And as you note, the last chapter in my book is called The Gen Z Burden, because what was really important to me, and again, I wrote this book in conjunction literally with my Z team. So I have a team of Zs who works on my Z Speak side that is between the ages of 19 and 24. And it's really intentional to me that they're all Gen Zs. And then in addition, the thousands of Zs that we interviewed and that worked with, et cetera. And it was really important to me that as we wrote the book, that it was really their voice and their worldview and their perspectives, right, that were creating the content for this book and that it was really my privilege to represent that, right? And as a cultural, cultural expert, generational expert, being able to put that into the larger context, right, of our evolution as humans and our evolution from one generation to the other, et cetera. But so I learned so much from this book. I mean, I was excited to write the book because, as I said, I felt there was a deficit in our understanding of this generation and that we were really discounting them for just staring at their screens and being angry and canceling people. And we weren't really telling the true story. As I continued to work over the last year and a half or two years with these Zs, I became more and more inspired and astounded. And so I want to ask everyone to engage with this generation because I think that if anybody sits down, whether you're a parent or whether you're a business leader or whether you run an educational institution, to really sit down and listen and hear them speak, you will be amazed to understand, yes, they may only be 16 or 17 or 18 years old, or actually even younger. But as we've talked about today, the way that they have had access to everything happening in the world from a really young age, and the way that they have been engaging in this kind of discourse and understanding all of our differences and these different lived experiences and perspectives on things makes them incredibly wise. And I think that in many ways for us, Again, we like to think of ourselves as older generations, as having more lived experience, which we do, and more wisdom, which we do in some ways. But I think we also don't realize that we're part of the problem, right? We can be part of the problem because we become more complacent. And I actually give this, uh, the kind of analogy in the book of the, the kind of proverbial frog in the pot, right? Where older generations are looking at us. I mean, these older generations in climate, for example, right? They were born onto a climate that is already heating. They have lived through the last six hottest years on record. Over 50% of them say that where they live has already been impacted by client. They have the lowest dated incidence of ever having children because they look ahead to 2030 and 2015 or climate projections and say, gosh, I don't know if I want to raise children on this on this planet. And they see all of those things and they look at us and we're like the frog in the pot who was, you know, who grew up decades and decades ago before we had all the awareness of what was happening on climate, certainly before we were at this point in our climate trajectory. And we're in that pot where the water is gradually coming to a boil. We're still swimming around in the pot and the Z's are saying, do you not see what we see? Why are you not listening to us? Jump out of the pot, right? 
And so it really is engaging with them. And the reason that the chapter is called the Gen Z burden is because there is a dark side and I never want to be Pollyanna about any of this. Yes, they are an extraordinary generation because of the time that they were raised and the access that, that, are, that their digital nativism has given them and a number of other things. They're young, they're kids, their childhoods were largely taken from them because the spaces of innocence when we were growing up, the school lunchroom, the soccer field, our bedrooms late at night, aren't safe spaces for them because they have their devices and they're watching everything that is ugly and real unfold in the world in real time all the time. So they really, they really grew up quickly. They really had their innocence stolen from them at an early age. And there's a burden. They have high levels of stress and anxiety. They have high levels of mental health struggles which have been documented. The APA is actually creating new terms to describe some of the issues that this generation is struggling with, like climate anxiety, you know, climate-induced PTSD. These things are real. And so they feel that they are isolated and that they see these things and that older generations aren't engaging with them in the way that they would like. So all they're asking is for us to really see them for who they are, give them a seat at the table, ask them for their opinions and their ideas, and engage them in that conversation. At the very end of my book, I, I write, I have a little section where I say the sequel. And I say, we all get to start writing the sequel to this book right now. This coming decade is going to be a critical decade for us. You know, in terms of climate, for example, we're just talking about climate. We need to stay under the 1.5 C number on climate by the end of 2030, or the trajectory is absolutely terrifying, right? We need to make that happen on climate this decade. There's so much that we need to do now. We're at this kind of critical apex on so many of these issues, and it requires us all to work together. And as I really look at where some of the most inspiring ideas are coming from, and again, these aren't just angry kids. They have solutions. They have ideas. Listen to them. That's where a lot of the really interesting, inspired ideas are coming from is when we engage them. So we need to do that. And that will help support them and alleviate some of the Gen Z burden and will help us all move forward. So I appreciate your comment about anxiety and depression because I've been reading the stats and it didn't make sense to me why kids are so anxious and depressed. But the point that they're getting the same news that I am, that as I watch people um, from Afghanistan holding on to airplanes that are taking off, it's just heartbreaking. How, do, how would I process that as a young person without the context and the life experience and the arc of history where I could compare it to how did we exit Vietnam or how did we navigate other conflicts? This would seem incredibly real and present and impact my entire worldview going forward. And that they are talked about as the most activist generation. I write about them as the most activist generation. And it's because they have to. It's interesting when you really break it down with Z's, they feel that they have to be, they have to do something, right? They're taking all of this in from such a young age. You can't take all of this in and just be unmoved by it and do nothing about it. And so that really calls upon them to be activists, to be the activist generation. When we go back to the anti-war protests in the, in, the, in the 60s, for example, we think about the boomers in the 60s as being the last really activist generation, but the largest anti-Vietnam War protest was 500,000 people in DC. So they're mobilizing in these huge numbers and that's, you know, that's really why because they feel that they're being called to action. We need to take action on these issues. It feels like we're in a dire state on a lot of these issues. It's amazing, because I feel like I need to do something too. And for me, the podcast is something I can do. That, that my commitment is to elevating leadership across the range of people who will be addressing these issues. As an 18 year old, I wouldn't have the same platform so I understand the struggle of how do I support the changes that, that I see need to happen as a 17-year-old in high school or as a 19-year-old just out of school. 